Well, that's quite a bit of pressure, huh? To explain blockchain uh, within how many minutes? Where's the timer? 15, probably. So this is the introduction to blockchain through the problem of inequality. And this picture was taken in 2004 by Tuca Vieira in Brazil. This is around um, Sao Paulo. And this is one of those pictures that shows this very, very striking contrast between rich and poor. This is an actual picture. This is not photoshopped. Uh, this is a very, very rich uh, neighborhood, a gated complex, if you will, that is next to a favela where very, very poor people live. And um, if you watched uh, the movie or read a book about Jay Gatsby, he was one of the examples of a very socially mobile person. He started very humble, but then he was able to throw very expensive parties, right? And uh, there's this, this thing that economists, economists call the Great Gatsby Curve, um, which shows an interesting relationship between social uh, economic inequality and the intergender, inter um, uh, mobility between generations, intergenerational mobility, right? And so basically, if you are to the right and very up, if your country is there, that's not very good. But if you are uh, in the left bottom corner, that's pretty cool. And Denmark is there and, and a few other countries. And U.S. is kind of very close to Brazil and Peru, Peru and other countries. Um, and this is how we measure inequality. But is it good for us to be in the lowest point of this plot? And I argue that, no, it's not good. Imagine how the world would look like if everyone here and in this country and in the world would have the same income. How uniform the world would look like. How dull. We need inequality. It's natural. Even for the life to exist on this planet, we need an energy gradient that the sun provides to us, which is a form of inequality. And in terms of diversity, I think inequality is equal to diversity. That's its definition. Usually when we talk about diversity, we only talk about racial diversity, and that's kind of what's shown in, in this uh, Lego picture. But it's more than that. Why? Don't we include other categories, your abilities, your genetic background, your income? So our, I argue that inequality equals diversity, and it's very much needed and necessary for progress, for life to exist. But why are we talking about it then? You know, if inequality is kind of good for us, what is the problem? And the problem is artificial barriers that some entities out there, organizations and, and perhaps governments, put in place. Uh, and let's see, at, let's look at the United States. So this is the Lawrence curve. This is another way of, of measuring inequality. And uh, the, the red line represents this, this dull world where, ev where everyone gets the same level of income. Everyone is, is the same, right? So the... the Goldilocks zone, if you will, is somewhere in between and under, under that red line and, and the rest of, the, of this graph, right? And um, the, the blue line represents where the United States were uh, in 1970, and the green line is today or a few years ago. And that is a progress in a wrong direction, I think. There's this great article, very recent, just a few days ago in The Atlantic by Matthew Parker, and he talks about this new aristocracy, how people learn, people in the 9.9% of the population in the United States, how they learned um, how to take the advantage, the meritocratic advantage that they had for many years now, and pass it to their children. Basically, they're reducing this intergenerational mobility that what I was talking about in case of the uh, Jay Gatsby. But take a look at those two lines at the bottom. 
they represent one, one line, the, the dark line represents the 0.1% of the society in the United States that currently holds 20% of all the wealth. And the other line is um, the line that represents the wealth that is currently owned by the rest 90% of, of, the, of the population in the United States. 0.1% of all people in the US and 90% of people in the US have the same cumulative wealth. How crazy is that? And I think there are problems that allow people in this 9.1 or 0.1 and 9.9% and .9 to preserve that, to preserve that status quo. Today, it's a standard. That's how our economy works. This is how we set up the capitalistic system. I'm not criticizing it, I'm try just trying to say that we need to fix it, that we need to put some uh, changes in place. So this, for example, this graph shows uh, that it's not just about individuals, right? It's not just about the individual income of people. Companies, corporations face the same fate. The richest companies out there are doing quite nice, while the rest of those companies bites the dust. Meet Martin Shkreli. He is a trader, he is a, an entrepreneur, and that's the guy that a few years ago bought a pharmaceutical company and increased the price of a drug for treating cancer from $13 per pill to 750 Well, that's how they do it. Right? You create a monopoly, there is no competition, there's nothing else, and, and they can do whatever they want with the price. That's why you guys are today on Facebook. You have no other option. That's why we're all using Google. We have no other option. How would blockchain help here? Right? So we have all those inequality problems. How is blockchain related to all that stuff? And it already helped us with this one case. The story of Bitcoin, the first blockchain project, is this. Satoshi Nakamoto, in 2008, frustrated with what was happening in the economy at the time, he decided to create a network, a currency, that would not be controlled by one company or, or a few companies or a government, to prevent what was happening in the economy at the time. In 2009, he released the first version of the Bitcoin software. And it's very hard to understand. It was very hard to understand for people back in the day. Why all the fuss? What's the change? It's just another version of internet money. Why do we need that? But Bitcoin unlocked this new technology that we can now use for different purposes. So if Bitcoin is a currency that no one can control, not the United States government, no any other country, no a bunch of banks, not a bunch of banks in, in New York, they cannot do anything about it. The Bitcoins that you own, if you're careful about it, they're yours. No one can take them from you. No one can make it so that those Bitcoins evaporate in uh, in the next crisis, in the next wave of bubble bursting events. Which is very cool. For the first time in the human history, we can do that. Now we can build networks that are not owned by one corporation that can and will abuse its power if they, if they uh, create a monopoly like that. Again, Take Equifax, take LinkedIn um, that uh, got hacked a few years ago. How crazy is that, that we give so much power to all those organizations, to all those companies, and we allow them to abuse it? Today, five biggest companies in the world, you know the names, are worth about $3.5 trillion. And that makes up 40% of, of the stock market in the US, 
the fate of the rest of the companies out there is to wait patiently to be sold to one of those monsters. Monopolies is a problem. And finally, we had to have monopolies for many cases, and then they work. Governments are a form of monopoly. Central banks have monopolies to operate and issue your local currency. But now we can finally deal with those problems, deal with monopolies, and create networks that work for the greater good of everyone, and not just one company or organization. Bitcoin is already a working project that you can use today. Yes, it has its problems. It's not perfect. But a lot of really, really smart people work on that. And all those problems with scalability, with the privacy of those transactions will be solved. I encourage everyone here to go to a blockchain event. There is a whole bunch here in Berlin and, and in Europe in general. And just take a look at how enthusiastic people are about that technology, what kind of things they're, they're building. It's amazing. Now we already have Ethereum, which is a blockchain-based computational platform. You can run any program, Ethereum language, computer language is Turing complete, which means that you can create any program and run it on this completely open platform. No one can stop you from doing that. No one. Amazon can disable your account and say that, no, you cannot store your files or, or your computer code on their servers. Ethereum cannot do that physically. It's impossible because of the rules that were put into that platform. There is a great quote from Naval Ravikant, one of the creators of um, AngelList and many other companies. And I'm not going to read from the screen, but this change, this new platform, this new paradigm of creating new networks, new types of networks, is groundbreaking, absolutely groundbreaking. If you're not paying attention to that industry right now, you should. And I would like to finish with this final thought that, yes, blockchain is a buzzword. And other companies and, and many people try to convince you that it's hard to understand, that it's rocket science, it's not. The thought is very simple. There is a network that can do something. And no one organization can control it. What can you do with it? It's a piece of public infrastructure. To me, blockchain is the next wave of transformational technology. The first was the, the creation of the computer, of course, and that technology was, luckily for us, never owned by one company. Imagine if it was. A few people tried to do that, actually. There was a lengthy battle in many cores that, that went on for like 20 years. Luckily, they didn't win. Imagine where we would be today if they owned a patent for a computer. The second wave was, of course, the invention of the World Wide Web. It was created at CERN in Geneva, and Tim Berners-Lee and his supervisors and managers and, I guess, many other people that were uh, in the chain of command, they said purposely that they don't want to own that technology. That technology belongs to the public domain. There was another competing project at the time. It was called the Gopher Project, the Gopher Protocol. And it wasn't as open. The, the institute that, where it was conceived tried to charge a license fee and tried to constrain that technology according to what they wanted to do with it. Didn't fly. The internet won because it's a completely open, completely free for you to use. And blockchain is the next wave of that transformation. You don't have to ask anyone to use Bitcoin. You don't have to ask anyone to use Ethereum. Those platforms do not store your data. You completely control all the data. You're automatically GDPR compliant. 
I know you're receiving a bunch of those emails these days. You wouldn't receive one from Ethereum or Bitcoin. You don't have to read through terms of service of those networks. They're very simple. They're written in code. So today, I would like you to, to leave you with, with this one thought. I think, don't believe me, but I think that this, is, this technology will change the world on so many different levels, and you have to pay attention. And just educate yourself about this technology. Don't believe anyone. Don't believe uh, big companies that are trying to convince right now the whole world that a private blockchain is a solution for scalability and privacy problems. What is a private blockchain? A blockchain that's owned by one company. Reminds you of something? So, hopefully, in the next two years, this technology will help us solve, well, not solve, but maybe remedy inequality on few levels. And along the way, solve a variety of other hard problems that we face as a society today. Thank you.